So let's look at some of these issues. A lot of them are going to um, really stem from that overcrowding that I was talking about that just sort of comes with urbanization. So um, a lot of immigrants, when they come to the United States, um, when they're very, very poor, they're forced to live in complexes called tenements. So tenements are low-cost multifamily housing designed to squeeze in as many people as possible, and they're used in very densely populated areas. So several families would live in one apartment, sometimes one room, multiple families living in them. Um, Owners of these tenements did not live in them. They would live in the suburbs or they would live in, um, you know, the Upper West Side, more fashionable places in the city, um, in nicer spots. Um, what you see right here um, is actually the first photograph um, inside a tenement ever. And it was taken in 1890 by a guy named Jacob Rees. Rees is spelled R-I-I-S. So Jacob Rees actually wanted to expose the horrible conditions inside a tenement and the reason why he's the first person to take a photograph inside is because a lot of them had no windows. There was no natural light coming in and um, electricity in these places um, was sort of, you know, iffy, not always great. Uh, wiring, not always available at all. And so on top of that, not really many people cared to document the stories and lives of people who um, were poor and living in tenements. And Jacob Rees came and you know, saw the horrible conditions that these people were living in and was like, you know, people need to be aware of what's going on and the conditions that human beings are living in here in the United States. So he took this photograph um, inside a tenement and uh, began to take a lot more and eventually published them all inside a book called How the Other Half Lives. And the other half he's talking about is the poor half. Uh, but we'll talk more about Jacob Rees down the line. So um, here are some more pictures that depict that all of those unsanitary conditions, which we'll talk more about in a minute. Um, you know, streets, unpaved streets would get ruts, and you see the uh, pavement here isn't really level. Um, there's just like piles of dirt and stuff everywhere. This is inside a tenement. This is all one room. Uh, many, many people living inside one room at a time. Um, uh, as you can see, they have like a wood stove. They don't really have beds. There's people sleeping on the floor, people sleeping on uh, wood tables. Um, just really horrible living conditions. Um, this is another one. Uh, one of the reasons why, uh, you know, I, I told you we, we couldn't take pictures inside. Jacob Reese now has a flash. All of these pictures were taken by him. All of these pictures are part of, are part of um, his series, How the Other Half Lives. So, like I said, those unpaved streets would get ruts after being used for a long time. And those ruts are sort of like ditches and they catch everything. They catch dirt and trash and just all sorts of nasty stuff. Uh, alleys are just like clogged with waste from tenements. Um, a lot of the unsanitary conditions come down to lack of plumbing in a lot of these tenements. Um, they've shared a toilet. Sometimes it would be, um, really most of the time it would be an outhouse. Um, and the shared toilets, you know, they might have maybe one or two toilets for an entire building. They would eventually overflow. And there was no, um, like real septic system. There was no indoor plumbing or anything like that. So if it wasn't emptied out, then it would just overflow and it would get into the alleys. It would get in those ruts on unpaved roads and just like raw sewage all over the place. So in the 1880s, city planners started coming up with plans for all of this waste, and they started developing filtration systems, water distribution systems to make sure that the water that we are drinking is not the same water that is being contaminated by all of this raw sewage. Um, but there's, you know going to be more and more problems anyway. Um, pretty much everything was a fire hazard. I mean, everything was a fire hazard. Um, one of the most famous um, situations to happen with a fire involving, um, you know, sort of lack of safety preparation is the Iroquois Theater fire. The Iroquois Theater um, uh, is in Chicago, well, was in Chicago. And they open up this theater, and it's really publicized as one of the most, um, you know, 
safe places you can be. This is one of the safest places. They took all of these precautions. They have all of these emergency exits. It's just, um, you know, a very the place that you should feel the most comfortable. It's a great place to be. Um, come to the Iroquois Theater. You know that you'll be um, sort of in good hands here. Uh, but it didn't really work out that way. So, uh, the, like I said, the Iroquois Theater is in Chicago. So it's in Chicago. Chicago is a very highly populated area. Um, so it, um, there's always more paid attention to um, safety. And before the opening of the theater, you know, the um, they had all this extra fire equipment. The Chicago Fire Department captain made this, like, unofficial tour of the facility to, like, make sure that they were doing all of the things that they said they were doing. And he found out that they were not. Um, he, there, I mean, there were no sprinklers. There were no fire alarms. There were no telephones. There were no water connections to hook up to a fire hose. Um, um, it was just like they had said that they were, you know, like the most fire and safety ready. And then the captain of the fire department went in and was like, you are the opposite of that. You are a fire hazard. You are a fire waiting to happen. You have got to fix these problems um, immediately. And so, you know, he sort of told them, gave them a long list of all the things they were going to need to do. Um, was g telling them of different fire extinguishers that they were going to need to get, uh, things like that. So uh, they're like, yeah, 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 we'll do all this. Great, wonderful. So on December 30th of 1903, they're having a, you know, the theater had been open for a little while at that point. It was, I mean, it was still relatively new. It had opened, um, gosh, I don't know when a few months before that it wasn't very it was still on the new side and they were showing like a Wednesday matinee you know a daytime performance of whatever show they were doing in this show this musical it was like very kid friendly and so they were advertising it a lot to families they were saying you know like here's a Wednesday daytime um thing you can do come bring your kids families everyone come to the show so they set, basically sell out this sh show for every seat. Every seat is sold out. But obviously money is um, what the whole world revolves around essentially. And all these and the people that are running the theater are like, let's just sell um, standing room tickets also. So they create these standing room areas at the back of the theater where um, you don't have a seat, but you're just, you're literally just like standing. Um, and obviously eventually you're not, no one's going to want to stand during an entire musical that's like two hours two and a half hours long no one's gonna want to stand that whole time so eventually people you know start sitting down in the aisle sitting in the standing area um there was about um to like 2,100, 2,200 people in the theater. We're not 100% sure because of that standing situation. We know how many seats were in the theater, but there were more people in the theater than there were seats. But there were a lot of children in the room. Um, a lot of children. Pretty much everyone there was a was some was a family of some type. Um, so about 3:15 that afternoon. Um towards the beginning of the second act, um, there were some sparks coming from an arc light that was above this very big, massive, like, theater curtain on stage, and the curtain caught fire. I mean, I'm sure it was just, like, a short, short circuit, something very simple. A, the show must go on. They did not stop the show. A stagehand um, sort of, like, used a fire extinguisher thing to try to, like, douse it, but it spread to the uh, fly gallery, which is the part that's like sort of way at the top of the stage. Um, and there are several thousand square feet up there of uh, a painted canvas where it was just scenery, you know, that will drop down as backdrop. So just tons and tons and tons of canvas up there. Very flammable. It's got paint on it that's flammable. So the stage manager is like, well, let's uh, drop the fire curtain. And the fire curtain is meant to sort of drop on top of all of this stuff and sort of snuff out the fire. But but it snagged and it wouldn't drop all the way. Um, now, keep in mind, they're not stopping the performance really with this. They're sort of, they're, they continue on going. So they try a couple more things. Um, they 
go on stage. Uh, the crowd obviously can see the fire. They see this happening. They haven't had anyone evacuate. They're still planning on going on with the show, like I've said. And this guy goes on stage. He's like, you know, everything's cool. Don't panic. We're about to put it out, and then we'll continue with the sh with the show. He later said the guy who went on stage and um, was telling everyone not to panic and not to. Leave. He told everyone, "Don't leave." Um, he later said, "It struck me as I look out over the crowd during the first act that I had never seen so many." women and children in the audience even the gallery like the top was full of mothers and children um so just to sort of make matters worse so obviously as time goes on people eventually are like nah this fire is not getting snuffed out we we need to evacuate so people start trying to leave um the dancers finally leave uh the people on stage managed to get out um for the most part some of them did some of them didn't uh one girl uh, was like an acrobatic type performer and she like got caught and hung on something and she got killed um but finally they everyone starts trying to get out so they try to go out the emergency exits um and see that the fire escapes are unfinished they literally just like went into nothing and there were still several stories below so some people start trying to jump off uh from the fire escape anyway and they fall or they slip and they all die pretty much um unfortunately Fortunately and unfortunately, the bodies of the people who jumped in the beginning managed to break the fall because so many people were were dead at the bottom. They started to break the fall of people who continuously began jumping. So after enough people had died, some people started to live when they began to jump off. Um, now, there were students, college students at the building next door, and they started trying to bridge a gap between the their windows and the fire escape they laid this like uh, wood plank across and they managed to save a couple of people get them to sort of crawl across into the next building before that broke now like I said the fire uh, or like I said the um, fire department pointed out there was no fire alarm at all and no telephone so it took some time to actually alert the fire department that there was a fire um, it they found out because a stagehand had literally run to the nearest firehouse. They had someone from the theater physically run down to the fire department and tell them that it was on fire. And it had taken them, you know, several minutes by the time they managed to realize what was going on and get down there. Um, so they get down there and it takes them a while, though. I mean, it's Chicago in December. Everything's icy and snowy and it's just um, it takes a, some, a longer amount of time for the police or not for the police, but for the fire department to get down there. Um, so. People are looking around looking for these fire exits. I told you the fire escapes aren't finished. Um, a lot of the doors were actually not really doors. They were like decorative doors, parts of the wall painted to look like doors. So people were running down these hallways going towards what they thought were escape, like a place to escape. They thought they were exits, and it was just wall. Um, the actual fire escape doors were hidden behind giant curtains that no one could see so there were these massive massive piles and piles of dead bodies in front of all of these fake like decorative doors um by the time um they were able to figure out where the um actual fire escape doors were the fire escape doors opened inward. They didn't open out. You know, I mean, you know, when you see an emergency door, it opens out so that the flow of the crowd keeps the door open. Uh, these doors opened in. So when, so you had to back up to open the door and it was, and uh, people were being crushed, um, sort of like a stampede situation. There were piles of people and dead people in front of these doors. Um, they estimated that, oh, like over 500, almost 600 people were killed the day of the fire, actually in the fire itself. Um, but, you know, like like 30 more people died uh, later on from other injuries, smoke inhalation, different things like that. Um, like I said, of all of the actors, only a couple of people died. Um, pretty much everyone who died, uh, for the most part, was um, people who attended the um show that day all these patrons so this was just sort of proof as to why fire safety is important um, the precautions that people should be making um, after this they do a, a massive investigation into what went on at the Iroquois theater what they could have done differently and we start making 
um, plans to keep people safe. Neighborhood watches and new police techniques are going to be developed to combat crime. We're going to develop the first system of mug shots. We're going to start fingerprinting for the first time. Safety is really going to start to be a lot um, higher on our priority list. Um, but this is going to lead to clashes between ethnic groups, which is going to sort of lead to our first gangs. Um, ethnic groups, different immigrant groups, they're going to want to keep their own group safe from other people. So they'll develop gangs within their ethnic groups and they'll there will be rivalries and then we'll see um, things continue to snowball from there.